Welcome to a show about things you can see Without going far and a lot of them are free If you thought there was nothing in the old hard land You ought to hit the black op with these fools in a van Look out, they're driving hard Checking out art in their own backyard Randy does the steering so he won't hurl Mike's got the map, such a man of the world That's done with the camera, kinda heavy on his shoulder And that giant ball of tape, it's a world record holder Look out, they're driving hard Checking out art in their own backyard Look out, they're driving hard Checking out the world in their own backyard Checking out the world in their own backyard TV mailbag. Where have all my weasels gone? Hi, Don the camera guy here. On these wet and gritty streets of the Inner Harbor, looking for those producers with whom I travel. And now that they're found, they seem to be saying something about something it's hard to believe we get. Viewer mail. This is from Jennifer who writes, I was watching Rare Visions and Roadside Revelations for the first time today, and it suddenly occurred to me that Don the Can Rumor guy sounded very familiar. And then it came to me, the narrator that is on the Cabbage Patch Kids audio tape that I used to have when I was little. No, say it I, isn't true. I'm no. wondering if you can confirm for me whether or not he was actually the narrator on that tape. Fess up, you were the, you were the voice of the Cabbage Patch Kids. Come on, Don, you know you were. Oh sure, I made a fortune. I just do this for the coffee and pure pleasure of being cooped up in the back of a minivan. It's just like home. But at least I won't be cooped up for long since we're just heading around the harbor to a place I never thought we'd actually get to see. The American Visionary Art Museum, complete with its own Wallace Simpson whirly gig whirling away here at the foot of Federal Hill. Oh, say can you see, three floors full of stuff made by folks who weren't trained to make it. This ought to be good. Isn't it great? I mean, Vallis is one of our all-time heroes, and this was designed almost to be like a giant, almost in the sense of a Tibetan prayer wheel from day one to give life to the whole center. We actually designed that he would come and he would, you know, permit us to have one of his whirly gigs without knowing that that actually would happen because I couldn't imagine this museum not having the whirly gig at the center. You know, people love this place. People who like hate museums. My favorite day of all was when we had a whole group of Hell's Angels here, this really happened, and the Junior League. The Junior League were happy to be here, and everybody got along. It was like, you know, because there's something about the place which is just very welcoming to everyone. Jonathan Swift defined vision as the art of seeing things invisible. And I thought that was a pretty good um, definition of delusion too, because, <laughs> but at the same time, that's what genius does. It sees possibility where everybody else hasn't. We're debt free. I've kept it debt free. I've never taken salary, but now we're looking for one $25 million. One, one that's <laughs> we're only 24 million, 999 million away now <laughs> from having this museum endowed. We have, uh, we have the largest collection of Ted Gordon's work, who, who is kind of a recluse in California, lost his wonderful wife, Zena. And you can see it's all free hand work. I just love it. This is probably one of the most miraculous pieces of art, I think, that has ever been made. It was made by a, a, a woman who was committed to a mental hospital by her husband and town physician. When she got in, she begged for a sewing needle. There was no thread, so all of the blues come from unraveled blue jeans. There's this incredibly charming figure here of almost a kind of a, a flapper girl with her, her hose, et cetera. And she told the, the, the news stories from the day over here, you can see a patch which says um, the founding of Palestine and Israel. She was very aware of current affairs, but uh, at the time, the ward note said she sews without purpose because she wasn't making like aprons for other people. Gerald Hawks was one of the most extraordinary men I've ever known. And he had been brutally mugged coming home from shock trauma where he worked. And in that mugging had permanent brain damage and his life fell apart. 
everybody kind of left him and he ended up living on the street and he ended up being a heroin addict. And he prayed that he wouldn't hate for the rest of his life. And he thought about using matchsticks. And he said that matchsticks are like human beings and that we all have the, the ability to give light or not, just like matchsticks. And he was also into math. I mean, everything was computed about how many uh, to make a square. He was totally a genius on that. And this guy, Emery Blagden, filled his barn with three times what you see here in complex healing machines uh, because he was so traumatized by how much of his family had died from cancer. And he would invite people with rheumatism and they would come in crutches and in wheelchairs just to sit around his healing machines. And uh, it was his kind of love song to, to people. Here it says, these few have influenced millions. And it's a totem pole of Hitler, Elvis, Martin Luther King, the devil, and Christ. And here, if you can see the soldier here, the face was made by a, an upended big gallon jug, a plastic jug of milk. Whatever was at hand. Uh huh. Here you find these pair of women's silk leggings with thousands of little flowers embroidered. But if you look very carefully, this person gave herself a little bit of male anatomy. Mike has appeared just like that. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite stuff is when people just, you know, are building the Garden of Eden in the backyard, not as art, but because they're in communion with something bigger and they want to leave something more perfect behind. And for me, it makes a kind of art that doesn't try to emulate or please another. It's of this whole other dimension. We have over 4,000 pieces in our permanent collection altogether. Um, and we have some fencers, but we depend on people kind of gifting. Well, otherwise, we do these mega thematic shows that are up for 10 months, and we show the best of the world's collectors. Because once you start that slippery slope of purchasing art work, I've never taken salary, so I mean, we watch every dollar here. So we, we don't really have a big budget for acquiring. I feel a dollar coming on. I feel a... <laughs> oh, my two. God. Al, oh, we're second to we are you. You're, that's, we're almost, we've doubled our, our, our naming campaign <laughs> due to the cameraman alone. <laughs> Thank you. I think that visionary art speaks to the primacy of why people ever made art. We say when the life experience is too big for words, it'll come out as, as this, because they, they have so much in them they have to say. And our museum is very unusual. Um, at, every morning at six o'clock, a whole bunch of Down syndrome adults come here and clean the entire building. And they come and they tell us what sucks in every new show and what they really love, you know, so they give us feedback instantaneously. We have a very untraditional, out-of-the-box way of operating, but that has, has really served the art and the people who work here and the people who visit very, very well. You know, I'm thinking, because I heard you, you need some money. Oh my gosh, we do. Uh, <laughs> How many are in there? Is it endless? <laughs> and, where, and where are you taking these from? <laughs> Would you believe Cabbage Patch payments? Just kidding. But not about how much we like this place and the vivacious visionary who brought it to life. And the gift shop's great too. We're not worthy and we don't care who knows. Orleans first, but that's because we weren't, we came a different No, we're on North Broadway already. Right, so, so I do this, right? No, you don't. Oh, yeah, I, well, it's, no. If you were wondering how long we could navigate the big city without getting lost, wonder no more. Hey, we've been here already. Sure, row houses and brick streets and more row houses are a big part of Baltimore's charm. I don't see anybody rowing. But we need to find someone. Paul Darmafall, AKA the Glass Man, a Korean War vet, laborer, and as it turned out, quietly prolific maker of pieces like these we saw yesterday at the museum. I got this glass from the free country, free nation, and I made a picture out of it. I just walked around, picked up a broken glass, that's all. Yeah, people call that art. You don't call it art, huh? It's just a picture to me. I'm not an artist, and I, I never was an artist. But pick and shovel, <laughs> that's work. <laughs> they are beautiful. When the, when the sunshine or the light hits them, they are beautiful. 
I think he started in 73. I'm not real sure about the date, but I think it's around that time. He did it under trees, and he would hang them in the trees. He would hang them alongside the road. And I suppose that's how it started. I don't know. So each little piece of this stuff you had to pick up? I broke it up a little more, a little more than what it was. But uh, that's the way it was when I, when I got through breaking it up. And it wasn't any piece any bigger than that. I like the subjects of your pictures. You have, you have a lot of history in your pictures and you have other things like that, right? No, 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 I didn't do it for business. I, just, I did it just for showing. Well, George Washington was one man, one man who never told a lie, did he? Well, I ain't telling you no lie. I picked it up, picked, picked, broke the glass up and broke it up and made pictures out of it. Well, he always talked about George Washington, yeah. And George Washington didn't tell a lie and all that cherry tree chopping and this stuff. And, talked about Einstein and different things like that, you know. Did art classes when you were a kid or something, or you were you always drawing? No, there they were no art classes in my, 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 my home. We worked, that's all. <laughs> we had a workhouse, that's all we had. And that's what this is, is work. Well, he doesn't do much now because he don't, I don't think he feels like really messing with it, you know, but before, He'd get up early in the morning and sometimes do it six, seven, eight, eight hours a day. You said it, you thought it helped him feel better when he did it. Oh yeah, I think it was therapy for him. Cause other than that, I don't know what he would've been doing, you know? The subject of the painting, like I said, it's a free country and free nation. That's all I got to say about it. I got it from free country and free nation and, and now it caused nobody no trouble about it. I just ain't got nothing to work with no more. I got the place, I got the place where you can see, you look around, you can see the place is pretty well cleaned up with glass, broken glass. <laughs> so after grabbing some sloppy affection from Paul's dog, Dum Dum, we resume the driving portion of our show, driving back toward downtown. This, as you may know, is or was home to John Waters and Divine, Cal Ripken, Edgar Allan Poe, Bromo Seltzer, and the American Dime Museum. We're not going there, but we have found a collector of the highest order not far away. Dan Van Allen and a painter named Spoon are bringing new life to a whole row of Baltimore's oldest housing stock. These houses were built in 1850. And I built a rustic porch with locust wood. Locust is like rot-resistant wood. They say that locust fence post will last longer than the hole that you put it in. I have an Osage orange tree back here, mulberry, elm. There's a swamp magnolia and a locust. Was the idea to create some haven within the city? or? Oh, yeah, sure. I try to create my own environment. I have an altar to the sea gods over there underneath my original canoe. This is all my overflow marine and things I collect, beachcombing. So this is Annabelle, it's my van, and on top is La Malinche, it's my latest sailing canoe. This is the mast here, so it's about a 17-foot mast in the figurehead. Cuts quite a striking figure in the water. <laughs> this design is taken from an ancient Cretan pot, and that's the Aztec with the talking skull. Well, it sounds like cultures of the world are, are a theme with you because not just tires, but rooms. Yeah, so there's theme rooms, a voodoo room, a Hindu room, Mayan room, Egyptian, and the coconutorium. Who's the genius who thought of this? Am I on? You're on, you two are on. This ought to do it. Come on. Most of these houses had hatches in the roof that you could climb out of. This is a summertime hatch to replace the clear wintertime skylight, and the doll will spin around in the wind. Would you boys put a little light on that for me? So this is one of my pieces of artwork here. I call this St. Anthony's Bone. It's another little. Wow. I hope that St. Anthony's not looking for you. <laughs> Let's go. This way, Donnie. So this is the Mayan room. These are all images taken from Mayan art. We ground our pigment with beer and egg yolk. So we had a little bit of beer for the artist, a little bit for the paint, a little bit more for the artist. 
Here's a portrait I did of Dan out of a um, scuba costume I found on the beach. We've got a nice deck out here. You can hang upside down out here on the deck. Uh, I don't know. How was I chosen for this? Yeah. <laughs> You're not shaking me, are you? No, we weren't, sh we weren't letting anything happen to you. probing me, are you? <laughs> <laughs> so hands back. <laughs> I think it's time for us to go. <laughs> Ooh. Do you feel taller yet? Uh, is that what's supposed to happen? Well, it stretches your spine back out. Really? Like, they I thought I would. Pushing <laughs> you down all day. <laughs> and then here is the coconutorium. Most of these coconuts come from the Philippines, but I find them in thrift stores. The Miss Piggy's pretty cute. Acquisitions continual every time you uh, can get one? Oh yeah, if you see any coconuts, send them on over. <laughs> so the Egyptian room's not finished yet. Eventually I'm gonna put a border around here and some more Egyptian columns. So if you wanna come down, I'll show you the voodoo room. All right, this is the uh, voodoo flag. This, these sequin flags they use in the temples in Haiti. I like voodoo because they have lots of gods and they represent lots of parts of the psyche. And I have other collections of pot, pot shards from Maryland beaches. Um, right here in Baltimore, great pot shards here. And this is the Hindu room in here. So we have Joggernaut and three-headed Shiva. There's a snake altar in over the fireplace. And back here is the tool room. Yeah, I stay busy. It's try to keep happy. It's instinctual to build your own house and collect things, decorate. Everybody has different, different needs. I have a high need for order. But wait, there's more. Dan was determined to show us Spoon's amazing eight-track tape collection, a card trick is rabbit nose, and across the alley, the oldest livery stable in the country, still livering. We then felt compelled to show off our claim to fame, the world's largest ball of videotape. Oh my God, it's so heavy. No cereal filler ever. Then it was bye bye Baltimore, hello Beltway, putting us precariously close to the powers that be. And yet another example of incongruous advertising, if that's what this is. You guys have outdone yourself here. <laughs> well, I really can't take any of the credit for this. It's so mysterious. Yeah. Okay, well, it's mysterious though. If you drive by it every day, you probably think, why in the heck is there an Easter Island head at the Glenmont Auto Gas? Uh, don't you? I suppose I might think that once. Uh, Hold on a minute. I know what to do. <laughs> <laughs> and there's your damn water tower shot, too. Yeah, at least we salvaged something out of this situation. Quite a view, isn't it? And even though D.C. is the other direction, being this close to the halls of government has inspired us to play some catch, if possible, near some large and perplexing object. What's with this uh, gazebo here? What is with this gazebo here? It's the, big, it's, just, it's the big acorn, right? Well, I'll let the viewers be the judge. This wasn't even a country when they built this, right? 1850? Oh, I thought you said 1650. What's 200 years amongst friends? <laughs> <laughs> no, details aren't always the boy's strong suit, which will soon become even more apparent in yet another nearby burb. Seems someone's research shows that this might be the final resting place for one of our favorite movie dogs ever. Petey from The Little Rascals, whose real name was apparently General Jigs. But that's about all we know, and given the size of this place and lack of better directions, that may not be enough. I know I looked back there, that's Skippy. Skippy? That's Skippy. Lassie, la oh. I said, that's, that's Petey, but it's not the real Petey. Petey, the real Petey may not be the real Petey. It's the wrong Jigs. It's, yeah. it's the wrong damn Jigs. Come on, one Jigs is as good as another. And Bunny, I miss you. 
So though throwing in the towel is not easy for producers to do, this was one hunt we had to call off. But the little guy would have wanted us to go on anyway, all the way to Washington. And that is why our gang is now crossing the Potomac, all of a sudden seeing the sights that all Americans should someday see for themselves. Katie, is that you? And one of the sights Americans never tire of seeing is Forge Theater, where Honest Abe met his tragic end. But you can't chew gum in there, so clever kids have transformed this little linen across the street into a tribute that's as colorful as it is sanitarily unsound. Uh, I think that's some Wrigley's, and uh, that looks like Bazooka Joe to me. Beach nut? Beach nut, could be. After sticking a couple Lincolns on ourselves, we decided to try some Homeland Security. Rare vision style. You didn't take any gum in there, did you? Well, you're good Americans. We thank you. You didn't have any gum in there, did you? No gum. Now nah, you didn't take any gum in there, did you? All right. That gum tree must be doing the trick, and I may have found a new line of work. At any rate, we had just one thing now left on our capital city agenda. Visit a museum. There's plenty to choose from here. Science, history, even a new one all about spies. But the prize in our eyes is this one, the Squish Penny Museum, whose curators have thrown open their home to share the joys of elongated coins. Uh, well, it's actually Christine's fault. Yeah. She got her first in 1990. And in 1995, we were traveling in Berlin and I got my first, and uh, it's really her fault. She introduced me to the machine. I spent all my money on it, had to borrow money to get back to the hotel. And ever since then, we've been on the Squishin' mission. Uh, squish pennies have a long history. They go back to 1893. They were at World's Fairs for a long time. Uh, and then the hobby sort of went underground, but it's kind of come back with the commercial machines, uh, becoming more and more popular, and that's how people get introduced to them. Kind of closet squishers for a while there? Um, yeah, kind of clandestine squishing dens, uh, pe people's <laughs> garages and their basements and their rompous rooms. This is our current exhibit. It's called The Open Road Touring America Today. And it's uh, pennies that you can currently find at roadside attractions, museums, zoos, towers. Some of these on here don't have squish pennies, but they top the list on places that should such as Big Brutus, uh, the Liberace Museum, places that you'd think would have one, but unfortunately don't. Um, Graceland has a kind of a funny story, yeah. because Graceland proper doesn't have any squish pennies, because apparently that's tacky and Elvis wouldn't do tacky things. But if you go across the stockade fence to the unofficial shops, there you will find squish pennies. One of my favorite pennies is actually, it's um, from Cadiz, Kentucky which is the home of the ham festival. And every year they commemorate the ham festival on a squished penny. And we do spread squishing joy wherever we go. Um, before we had our t-shirts, I had a squished penny on a chain and I would show people you know, what I was talking about. But now we go and we give people postcards and our own squished pennies and we sort of you know, show them how cool they really could be if they had a squished penny machine. What does the government think of you messing up their pennies? Perfectly legal. As long as you don't try to spend it. <laughs> now, can you hurt yourself squishing pennies? Children maybe shouldn't try this? Uh, on the commercial machines, you're pretty safe. Yeah. But on the hand crank ones, <laughs> potential for accidents. Our insurance agent doesn't know we have the museum. <laughs> How different than sausage making is it really? In other words, it's squishing time. Ta -da! So all hands on deck, though hands are the body part most at risk in this procedure, Be the penny, Mike. since 20 tons of pressure are needed to flatten a penny. There you go. All right. Does it still thrill you every time? Every time. Every time. And even more PSI may be required for Sacagaweas, though I'm the first to squish one here. Come on, buddy. You can, do it. You, oh, can do it. you can do it, you can do it, you can do it, you can do it. Oh, yeah, it here it comes, I oh, see it now. Of course, I was president of the coin club in junior high. Who's the most famous people who've been through the store? 
You guys? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's terrible, oh, man. man. That is sad. I'm sorry. We say that to everybody. Though. <laughs> that is sad, but we were still happy to sign the book and take one last look around before bidding adieu to the nicest couple that crushed currency ever brought together. Thanks for coming. Thanks it was so great to see you. Keep on squishing. This is Don the Camera Guy, signing off. Own a copy of the companion book to Rare Visions, complete with tips on where to find food, fun, and fascinating folks. It's just like the TV show, only it doesn't move. For information about the artists, wacky sites, and how you can see them for yourself, go to kcpt.org. They filmed that fabulous series, Homicide, down here. I loved it. Why is, uh... Homicide off the air in Rare Visions. Still on. I think you're doing important work, Don. What about me? What am I, chopped liver? Oh.